I, I, I do think this is probably the most, one of the most difficult issues that, that we deal with in, in, in the church today. Um, I'll never forget when, when Kristen, my oldest daughter, was born. We were living in, in um, um, Moorhead, Kentucky. I was running the graduate program there at the time. And um, I happened, that was a time when, when I guess fathers can still do this, but I, I got to go into the delivery room, and I was there when she was born, and, and um, they cleaned her up and, and handed her to me. Okay, now what do I do? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like the weight of the world descends on your shoulders at that, at least I felt that way at that time, thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> um, I'm very proud, excited, happy, but at the same time, there was, a, there was an amazing sense of responsibility that kind of descended uh, on me at that point in time and has never left. Those of you who have children um, or have had children in the past certainly have a sense uh, of that fear, uh, that responsibility that, that comes with that, that weight of the world, as I just mentioned, that um, that's, uh, it kind of descends on you when, when you have those children. And it doesn't go away. I mean, that's not something that, that's um, an afternoon or a weekend experience. <laughs> uh, it uh, kind of continues. Um, I thought when they grew up and when they graduated from college and got married and moved away that all that would go away, but it doesn't. Um, I still check on them, the one here in Tampa, daily um, because she's dealing with the same issue, having sons at this point in time, um, nine-year-old and a 13-year-old, um, but, um, but it's an intense responsibility. Um, and I think there, there's, there's not a lot of verses in, in the Bible that, that speak to this, but those that do, um, we'll get into some of those here in just a few minutes, uh, certainly give us um, a great sense of, of responsibility. Rearing children, and as young people grow up in today's world, it's not like it was a few years ago. Um, my daughter was telling me just a, a, f a few days ago, we were talking about, um, her son running around the neighborhood playing and, 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 um, uh, she was a little concerned about that. And I said, you know, Kristen, you know, when you were a child, we lived, um, in a development kind of out in the country, out close to, um, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And I said, we'd send you out and told you when dinner was time to find something for lunch and when dinner comes we'll we'll call you and come on in um many times i'd come home when i was a child and and my mom would it'd be a light raining oh, it's not raining that much going back out and play and come back later <laughs> so that's not the way it is today uh, there's all sorts of, of, of uh, different dynamics. Uh, I mentioned to Patty a minute ago that, that this whole family dynamic um, is much different today than it was just, just a few years ago. It's amazing to me when I look at some of the statistics that, that you see about, about young people. Um, <clears throat> they even keep statistics on the death of teenagers. And if you look at, at the... Um, um, not forwarding, so move me up a slide. Um, if you look at the uh, statistics about the, the uh, five leading causes of death in, in teenagers, you know, the first one is, is accidents. Um, I was watching a, a television program, um, that's been several years ago now, but for some reason the, the cameras were following this family as they got ready to and celebrated their... Um, uh, daughter's 16th birthday. It was very, uh, very well-off family, uh, well-to-do family. Had a really nice house. Um, so the first first few scenes, it was a, one of these reality things. 30 minutes show, and first few scenes, the mother's sick. The child just turned 16 years old, and and uh, they're at the DMV, and she's getting her driver's license. And and I thought the strange thing was she didn't drive home. I mean, she got back in the car, and her mother drove home. I thought, well, okay, 
when I went to get my driver's license, I drove home <laughs> from getting my driver's license because uh, that was kind of a rite of passage at, at that particular point in time. But, but then they're going through this, this, uh, all these elaborate preparations for this huge party they're throwing for this young girl um, that weekend um, after she got her driver's license because she'd turned 16 years old. And then you, then you uh, show up at the party, and there's probably 100 kids there. They've got a big pool out behind their house, and um, it was somewhere in, in the suburbs of New York City. But a um, big pool out behind their house, and it's kind of a beautiful home. <clears throat> and probably, I don't know, well into the, 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 the time that the party was going on, the father comes out and stops everybody and, and, and um, gets their attention. And he said, I'd just, I just like to give my daughter her birthday gift. And he handed her the keys to this sports car that had to cost $100,000. You know, I sat there and went, my first reaction was, well, my dad didn't do that. <laughs> and then when I saw her, <laughs> how she dealt with that car, that's a good reason he didn't do that. I know why he didn't do that. Um, I don't know that she'd ever had driving edu driver education. I don't know that she'd ever had learned how to drive. I mean, you never saw her behind the wheel of a car during that week while they were getting prepared. You always saw her riding with her mom, um, getting ready for the party. But handing her the keys to that, that vehicle, I thought, wow. I mean, th th I, I just don't understand that. Um, so, so accidents. I mean, that's an accident waiting to happen. One of my good friends in... in um, uh, Tennessee, Jim Woofter is a driver education um, trainer. And in my office building, we had a nice conference room. And uh, he would have, in the summers, he would teach driver education. And he used my conference room to teach driver education. And those kids would come in to drive. And he would take them around town. I thought he was taking his life in his hand every time he got in that car. Because they had no clue. I mean, it, you started, that's the brake. That's the accelerator. They had no clue, where, many of them, how a car operated, much less the rules of the road, laws that impacted uh, driving. Um, but he was kind of the uh, type of guy that could handle that sort of thing. But it wasn't unusual for him to come in and say, one of my kids had an accident. Now, I don't know that, he ever, that, that, that uh, he'd ever had a kid that, that lost his life in an accident, but, but still, accidents, the number one cause of death in teenagers. The second one is homicide. I, I don't understand this one. Either a teenager getting shot or engaged in active fire, active shooting at another person or with another teenager. Um, I don't know why that's why that's the number two cause for death in teenagers today. You know, I was trying to think about that in, in preparation for the, for the lesson of today, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe it has to do with the, the, how calloused we become because we see so much death uh, on television. Maybe it's the games that they play where they're um, virtual reality, where they're actually shooting at other people, and, and you see them die, and um, I don't know. Go ahead. Look at the popularity of churches anymore. They're going down and crime going up. So I think there's a correlation between the two. Certainly, certainly there is, is a lack of, of teaching principles. Um, and, and, and one of the principles that you see throughout the Bible is the value of human life. Um, I think that's, that's certainly um, that human life is precious. Um, and then the third one is suicide. Um, that, that's one of the saddest things that I can imagine, is, is having, having a child and having that child uh, commit suicide. What's going on in that child's mind that um, causes them to believe they have so little value? Um, there's just something going on there that, that's not right. And I, and I, can't, I can't fathom uh, what that might be. I, I never had those kind of thoughts when I was growing up. Uh, I don't think my daughter did. Um, go ahead. Um, sadly, 
I'm a pediatric nurse and I've seen two suicides of young children under ages of 10 this past year from cyberbullying where they were um, dared or and they committed suicide um, with things that you can't even imagine right in their bedroom all over somebody daring them or so it's it's sadly that's very common and it's probably again due to the technology and you know lack of moral teaching in the home you know? yeah yeah bullying I mean that's that's a word we didn't I mean there were bullies when I was anybody get bullied when you were a child several hands gone up I did it's different now it is, something makes it different today. Uh, yes? I think we've created a, a cultural norm in our society where cutting people down, ridiculing, arguing is like the accepted behavior. And this, this is pervasive in our, even in our sports talk shows and our news talk shows. On our reality shows, they, they highlight a group of people, and the most popular segment is when this person and this person got into a big fight. Yeah. Not anything to do with teenagers in that regard, but that has made its way down into the teenage ranks so that when they're playing on their video games and they're playing with each other, they're cutting each other down, they're smack talking, as the term goes, they're doing this, and that's become a, a cultural norm, which is a very. It has? Sad and dangerous reality. Yes. Well, let's, let's just look back and, and let's say 1940s, only not, uh, 40 years ago, when basically the norm of situation comedies on TV really changed with All in the Family and all that. Why did you see all that? It was one cut down, one uh, derogatory remark after another. and kids see that and they gravitate to it and it's gotten worse and worse. You can't even work one situation coming without some kind of cut down or put down. That's what that's what it said. And you know where they put these on? They put these on prime time. Yeah, they do. They do. Yes sir. I think one of the basic causes for most of all of this stuff is the ability of children to get drugs and alcohol. It alters their mind, it alters their conceptions, it alters their ability to drive, it alters everything, it alters the, you know, it causes depression, and I think that drugs and alcohol play the largest part in all of this. Well, certainly addiction has risen in, in young people way beyond anything that I ever remember when I was, when I was a young person. Yes? Uh, I feel that another thing, even though people will post positive things on like their social media, so just, oh look, we had a vacation, or we had this, or I'm accomplishing this, we kind of tend to look at ourselves and think, what have I accomplished, what am I doing? And it's always just, we're only seeing the most, the most uh, high points of people's lives, that's all we see. So we think, well my life's not like that, I'm not going on vacation all the time, I'm not always accomplishing something, but when you see that from multiple people and you think, well what am I? And it's just, it can put you down when you're, when really all you're doing is just saying, look what I've accomplished, come celebrate with me. It's, you can kind of see that the wrong way sometimes. And I think a lot of people my age. Have and the sad that. thing about that is a lot of stuff that people are posting on social media is not true anyway. That's true. They didn't even do it. They just said they did. And you're looking at it saying, why am I not, why am I not able to do that? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really tough. I saw, thought I saw another hand. Yes, sir. I'm, in, I'm going to preface this by saying I, I'm in no way advocating using a child. But we just talked about a few weeks ago about becoming callous to violence. That's an emotional callousness. I grew up on a dairy farm, and, and now my hands have no calluses. We were raising kids that have no calluses around their emotions anymore. They're just a solid nerve running around. Live nerve, it's just waiting to be plucked, waiting to be hit, waiting to be bumped into. I mean, when I grew up, it was you know sticks and stones. But now it's well, they can hurt. Well, they can, but maybe it's because we're not building up houses around our kids' emotions nowadays. 
we're putting them in bubbles and we're trying to see we don't want to hurt our kids and we're yeah. putting them in a bubble. But that's not how how you grow. That's not you don't put them in a bubble and, and keep them in a bubble and not keep them from getting hurt. We're going to get to that very example here. I mean, if you look at a lot of your up there, I mean, if you didn't have a nerve on your suicide, kids just can't handle yeah. any kind of anything. I think, I think that the ability to handle that has decreased dramatically and the intensity of the attacks has increased dramatically. And so when, when you do that, it gets really out of, out of control. Yes? One of the things about like, raising a child, nobody says no to them anymore because they're, they're afraid to hurt their feelings. So when they grow up and they get rejected, they, they can't handle that. So that really hurts them deeply, and, and it turns it to the day. Yep. You know, there, I knew we'd get a lot of opinions about things in here today, so this is a, um, thank you for, the, for those comments. It's, um, it, it, we're not going to fix it <laughs> today, but I, but I think, certainly think we'll be able to highlight some issues that, that, um, uh, that, that can kind of be very important to us. I do believe that at least when I was um, uh, teaching at the university level at two or three different schools, um, I saw a, a rapid over a period of time decline in the, the, the sense of self-worth that young people had. Uh, they didn't believe that they had anything to contribute. They didn't believe that they had any, had any, um, um, uh, had any uh, assets to bring to a relationship, a family, a job, a school, whatever it happens to be. Um, it just, and I think that a lot of times parents don't engender self-worth. They don't teach children that you have some innate value. You have, God loves you. You have some worth as a human being. Um, I, I saw a little t-shirt that a kid was wearing up in <coughs> Gatlinburg one time. It says, God don't make no junk. And I thought that, that's, a, that's kind of a cool thought because he doesn't. I mean, every one of these young people, and you see them running around the playgrounds and ballparks and all that sort of stuff, they have worth. They have value. Um, so how do we create? Yes, sir. Well, I, right from the very start, down to the outside, you talked about firearm training and children should know what firearms are, especially if you have any. So, and the suicide, you know, if you're involved with your family, if you have kids and you're not involved with them, uh, and if you just allow them to bury themselves in games and such, and you don't get them out with whatever you're doing, involve them with what you're doing, well, then you're doing a disservice to them. You've got to be involved in their lives so that. You can tell, I, I would say, I know my nerves, you know, I mean, when they, I can, it's like read their minds, you know, what they, what they are. And even if they argue with you, the one that argued with me the most, later on said, when she started dealing with those things, dealing with things with their kids, she said, she hated it at the time when I was disciplining her. My rules. She said, I sound like my dad. Yeah. And she, she said, what am I doing? I sound like my dad. Those are my dad's words. So if you don't involve yourself with them, even if they if you fight with them to the nail, if you're standing up for what you believe is right, and you can legitimately say, express that to them, if they ask, you know, uh, that I don't need to preach to them. I just, I don't have to be their best friend. Although I might turn out there, I have to be a parent, number one. I have to step away from the friend part to be a parent. We're going to get to that. Okay. So, <laughs> all these things now you can't deal with health issues. You know, you, I mean, I can't solve those. Right. But all these other things, uh, you, you have a lot of control over it. Family unit breaks down as it has in our society to a great degree. Uh, 
then you have to step up even twice as hard then and be both. You know? when, I, when I was a teacher at the university, I had uh, parents that would come to parents' day and they'd visit in my office. And, and uh, I had parents tell me, how's my child doing? And I'd, I'd give them some response, how my child was doing. And they said, well, I hope you can handle them. I just can't do anything with them. I thought, what? <laughs> They've given up. They've washed their hands of it. Um, yes? When you're talking about the self-worth, our culture makes it hard for the kids to have a strong self-worth now because we push them so hard. What it took to get in college back when I went to college versus what it takes for the kid to get in now, they're expected to come out, most of them. You're pushing now to come out of high school with a two-year college degree. You, yeah. have, you know, everything is being pushed if you're in sports. You're no longer playing it for fun. You're playing it to get the scholarship. You're playing it to be the best of the best. You know, band, whatever they're in, it is pushed so hard. The kids are no longer doing it for social and for fun yeah. and for self-achievement and feeling good about themselves. It's always pushing to that my next level. They succeed. You should be doing even better. And that's a very strong culture. It is. It is. In. So it leaves them feeling no matter what you do at home. It's leaving them still fighting that self-worth that they yeah. say they go into the university. Have you ever been to a Little League baseball game and listened to the parents? I mean, no. you coached? I didn't, I've got a claim to fame. I'm going to brag a little bit this morning. My, I coached Little League baseball one year, and my pitcher was David Cully. Anybody know who David Cully is? He's the new football coach at NFL Houston Texans. He's the head football coach. I've been meaning, he just was appointed about a month or so ago, I've been meaning to write him a note and remind him of the fact that I was his coach <laughs> when, he was in little, when he was in Little League Baseball. Um, but you listen to some of those parents berate their kids. They drop a ground ball, drop a fly ball, or they, miss, they strike out at the plate. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't. I would never do that. I don't think that's, that's appropriate, how some of them treat their kids. When Yes, Ron? I remember in the early 70s, a, a guy named Dr. Spock <laughs> wrote a book. And, and Which one? Huh? Which <laughs> book? <laughs> All I remember is that uh, he was well thought of by most young couples because he had a lot of nutritional and care for baby information that, that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten. But he also expanded that into raising the child in the upper years. And uh, I think that's where the idea of becoming a friend instead of a parent came from. Yeah, he became an, author, he became an authority on Vietnam, too, at one time. Did he? So, yes, he did. <laughs> I, oh, well, I like his books. <laughs> yeah, my kids had most of his books. Uh, I think he probably exceeded his uh, skill set there and some of his advice. But you're right. Exactly right. So, yes. All right, let's move on to the, to the next slide here. How do we engender that self-worth? Affirm the accomplishments of your children. Touch them in a positive way. Um, uh, some of you are talking about some, uh, there, was a, there was a philosopher, I guess, or behavioral psychologist, B.F. Skinner. You may have heard that name. Um, he's a behaviorist that uh, wrote a lot of stuff back in the 70s and 80s. Um, he had, a young, he had a young boy, a son, and he didn't want to um, transfer any of his preconceived notions to his son. Never touched him. Um, have you ever seen that movie, Boy in a Bubble? It's an old movie. A, a child was uh, uh, sick and had to live in a bubble. Well, B.F. Skinner's child wasn't sick, but he actually lived in a bubble. And by the time he got old enough to leave home and go to college, he had nothing to do with his parents. There was no relationship there. Um, and I, but I, so I think that there's some real positive 
um, um, results, benefits that can come from giving your child a hug. I mean, that, that, that's something that, and, and my mom and dad did that up to I was high school. I'd come out and after a basketball game, they'd be waiting for me and gave me a hug, whether I stunk up the joint that night or whether I played pretty well. Um, I mean, that, that, that just, just the way they were. My dad would shake hands with me. Um, and his, when he got to be 85, 90 years old, he gave me a hug. So I thought that was a step forward. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he felt comfortable doing that. But that, that was just the, uh, the nature <clears throat> of that relationship. Expect the best from your kids. Expect them to be able to do things without you helping them, without you assisting them, without you doing it for them. You know, once they, 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 they have a chance to learn some things, let them practice that. H.L. Uh, Minkin, who was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun, I put a, a quote in here. Um, once he stood on his desk in a newsroom and shouted, it's overwhelming us, it's covering our desk, and soon will cover us. What are you talking about, somebody replied. Mediocrity, Minkin replied. And with that, he got down off the desk, walked out, quit his job, never came back. Um, there, there's a lot of mediocrity in the world today. And we think that we should be outstanding without the effort necessary to become outstanding. Um, yes, sir. Your first point, affirm the accomplishments, but what happens a lot is we overhype normal everyday achievements as being some great accomplishment. Yeah. And so we build up these children to be no more than and that's always a challenge as a parent. Is they're looking, they're constantly looking for more and more and more. Yeah, yeah. So, what is it that you compliment your child for? Is it everything they do? Is it what you, they would have expected to do? Or is it something they've gone be of and beyond? Uh, they've exceeded expectations. That's always a challenge. Um, you know, that, 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 that's not something that, that's, that's an easy answer to that, uh, about knowing when, when to give your child feedback and, and, and what type of feedback to, to give them. So there's, there's challenges. Uh, next slide can, can talk about this. The challenges that face our children, I think it's boredom, I think it's apathy, and I think it's mediocrity. Um, author once said, young people today have nothing to do and too much to do it with. They get their direction from an adult population that doesn't want to get involved, doesn't vote, doesn't care. The philosopher Kierkegaard once said, this age will not die from sin, but from a lack of passion. They don't care. So, so I, I looked at that and I started thinking about, and I always compare this to, to my grandsons, and, and I, I don't see a lot of that in them, but occasionally it surfaces. Because I'll hear them tell, well, I don't care. I, I, I remember kids when I was growing up. They didn't get picked for the team. They didn't get chosen for a date. They didn't, whatever it was. Well, I don't care. And you know they did. If they didn't, they, you know, they're either psychologically maladjusted or they're lying. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, something that I think we need to look at. You know, we put this on the kids. I can see both of it, all right, about some of them just having lots of days of uh, skills, not learning skills, certain whatever they are. But do you, you remember there was a book just recently, we, uh, Greatest generation. Do you know how short that war was? It was only four, four years out, of the, four or five years in the Pacific. And from the day of invasion to the surrender in Germany, it was only nine months. Okay? They were prosecuting this war in Iran and Afghanistan for 10 years. Over, over 10 years, okay? I don't think you need to slight the generation that's, that's fighting those wars, that war. The war against terror. So when they say that it's that generation fought the greatest war, I mean the greatest generation, I think you're slacking in, 
in giving credit where credit is due, that uh, that's a generation of young men that volunteered. It wasn't drafted. That's another thought. You know, they, they, they volunteered for that. And, and they have successfully prosecuted the war. So, but there's a difference between those conflicts. The difference that we come to, in my mind, is if you're talking about World War II, if you're talking about the Korean conflict, those, everybody was on the same side. The entire country was behind, for the most part, what was being done there. And then you get to Vietnam, and the country is very divided. Half the people thought we shouldn't be there. My, my brother-in-law won't talk about it. He felt like he was. He went over there. He sacrificed a number of years. Uh, his health um, was was uh, came back with never really uh, health wise what he was before he went, um, and he won't talk about it because he felt like nobody cared, nobody appreciated it. Um, and I think there's been some of that in every conflict that has existed since then. All of a sudden, in the Vietnam conflict, uh, we stopped appreciating the sacrifices that, that our young men and women were making when they, when they were part of the military. And um, that, that's, that, that's not a good example to set. Um, but that's, it's not just military service. It's almost any service. Um, we stopped appreciating what people do at work. We stopped appreciating what they do in the classroom. We stopped, I mean, it's just expected. We just kind of live day to day. Um, the dynamics of that personal relationship um, are calloused. I use the word again, uh, to where we don't we don't have those feelings. We don't have that passion. We don't care as deeply uh, as, as as we as we seem as we used to. Um, Proverbs, the twenty second chapter, in the sixth verse. Um, one of the most telling, and and. and generates more questions in my mind than it does answers but it says uh, train up a child in the way is go in the way he should go and when he was old he will not depart from it um, there's a lot in that verse um, how do you train them what way should they go what do you mean by old <laughs> and what do you mean by depart from it I mean there's a you could have a series of, of lessons on, on that one verse. Uh, but I think what it does do is it says this is a complex relationship. It is not something that's easy, but it requires dedication. It requires focus. It requires attention. It's not just having a kid and hoping they grow up okay. I mean, it is a day-to-day, minute-to-minute effort that parents uh, should put in. So, so Prentice had some practical... Uh, first of all, let me... Let me he had a, a poem that, that he worked for a, a, um, a committee, uh, an organization in Missouri one time that, that dealt with um, uh, young people and children and, and helping them be successful. And um, they selected a, a poem by uh, Mamie Jean Cole um, that I thought was kind of an interesting, interesting poem and kind of surfaces some of the issues we're talking about here. And the poem goes, I am the child... All the world waits for my coming. All the earth watches with interest to see what I shall become. Civilization hangs in the balance. For what I am, the world of tomorrow will be. I'm the child. I've come into your world about which I know nothing. Why I came, I know not. How I came, I know not. I'm curious. I'm interested. I am the child. You hold in your hand my destiny. You determine largely whether I shall succeed or fail. Give me, I pray you, those things that make for happiness. Train me, I beg you, that I may be a blessing to the world. And I think that one of the things that that poem points out is that it's just not what I get as a child when I'm growing up, but what can I contribute as I grow, as I develop, as I become part of families, of schools, of jobs, having my own, what can I contribute? What can I give back? 
And I think that's something that, that we just don't, you know, we don't, we don't do that often. We don't encourage children to figure out, what can I contribute? Um, and I think, I, th I think that's something we miss from time to time. So, so Prentice has some practical suggestions in the, in the next slide that, that, uh, uh, to help children kind of rise above, above mediocrity that, that he talks about. One was, be aware of your child's natural tendencies. Observe those things. Um, Brady said in, in, in his book that, that uh, he asked his mom one time, his mom was my fourth grade teacher, but um, he asked his mom one time, he said, you know, he had a lot of respect for his father. He said, how do you think he did what he did? And his mom said, well, Prentice, he watched what you wanted to do and he helped you do it. And he, watching what you want to do, watching what you're interested in. I think sometimes I had a tendency to try to remake my children in my own image. I shouldn't have done that. Um, by that, I mean I wanted them to play ball. I wanted them to do this, that, and the other, whatever it was. Encourage them to do things I was interested Well, maybe they weren't interested in that. You know, one of them decided she wanted to, to, to uh, uh, take dance lessons. And I told somebody the other day, if I had a nickel for every hour I'd sit in the balcony of the high school gymnasium and filmed dance, re dance recitals, I'd be a rich man today. <laughs> Because they'd, they'd put you up there, their own parents could only sit in the balcony and, and they'd practice for eight, nine hours the week before the dance recital. And you could only videotape the practices. You couldn't videotape the performance. So I wasn't interested in that. But I was interested in them. Um, and I, I think that's what Prentice was talking about. His dad found out things they were interested in and helped them, helped them be successful. The second thing, and I think this is something that, that I didn't do, uh, and I wish I had. Expose your children to people you admire. I think that, that's key. And I'm not talking about public figures, and, but human beings, neighbors, friends, relatives. Take your children and expose them to people you admire. And let them know why you admire them. You know, I, I, I should have done more of that. Um, I think by chance I did that, but not intentionally. But thinking about having a conversation with my daughter, why we went over to those people's house? Why did we go with those people to that trip or that event or whatever it was? Exposing your children to people you admire. And then third, and probably the most difficult thing, is model that high achievement. Um, don't ask your children to do what you say unless you're willing to do it yourself. That, that's, um, that's difficult. Um, and I think modeling that behavior is something which, 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 which is essential. And then there was another suggestion in here, and it has to do with building fences. And this gets back to some of the comments that were made a little earlier. And we don't have much time. I'm about out of three minutes. Um, Boundaries. Contrary to popular opinion, I think that young people like boundaries. It gives them a sense of security. They know what they can do and can't do. They know what direction they should head and when they're deviating from that path. Give your children some boundaries. Build some fences. Define the limits of, of their behaviors. Once I, my, my, one of my daughters made some sort of uh, uh, comment about that I not want to be her friend. I said, no, I really don't. She said, what? I said, I don't want to be your friend. I want to be your parent. We've got time to be friends when you're old and you've got your own family. We'll be friends then. But this responsibility of being a parent... It's not that we, can't, we don't show our love, that we're not friendly. And that's not, not, the, not the point. But the point is we're not going to hang out and share stories together. <laughs> um, parenting is more than that. 
And I've also had children, I've also had my children and heard other children talk about, um, my, my grandson sometimes do this. He's got a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old, and 13-year-old just got his first simple little cell phone. Long after many of his friends, but you got it probably a little early. <laughs> and the nine-year-old, well, you're not treating me like you treat Zachary. There's the difference between equal and fair. And knowing that difference is tough for parents. I think parents need to be fair. But treating children equally is not the same thing because uh, some children have some capabilities, skills, um, direction, control, self-control that others don't. So finding that difference between fairness and equality is something that I think that, that, that's very challenging. Hodding Carter, who is a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize um, author, once said, you can give, give your children two lasting gifts. One of them is roots, and the other is wings. And I thought that was a, a good quotation. So let me conclude in this last second here by reading uh, Matthew, the 19th chapter, um, beginning with the 13th and going through the, the 15th verse. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he placed his hands on them, he went on from there. To me, that verse talks about the value of children. It will never have anything more valuable than the children that God has entrusted us. And I think uh, I, I, in your notes, I concluded with a, a comment here that one of the greatest fears that, that I have is doing something where I might disappoint my children or saying something that makes them ashamed of me as their father. I don't ever want to do that. And that's probably one of the strongest driving forces in my life. Yes? I think one of the things, too, when you talk about the pressure of society and parents being pressures that we don't want our, we don't want anybody to see us fail. And, and we especially don't want our kids to see us fail. But I was watching my daughter the other day. She was working on a project, and she was getting frustrated, and she wasn't dealing with it really well. And finally she just, you know, I was like, what's going on? What's, what are you doing? And she's like, well, Daddy, you don't ever have problems with this. You don't ever fail. So why, why am I having this problem? Sometimes we need to see, let our children see us fail. Yeah. We need to let them see how to deal with it. You know, we don't always deal with it properly either, but we have to let them know how to deal with this properly or whatever. But we need to let our children see us fail so we can help them know how to deal with failure. Sometimes because we're so as parents, we can't. We have, we want to be that, especially. Fathers, fathers want to be that rock on a hill, you know, for our family. But sometimes the kids have to see fail, so they know how to deal with it. Well, yeah, as we're growing up, you'd almost you hear these kids, well, my mom or my dad or um, whatever it is, um, they look to us as a role model and as guidance uh, and, and letting them know that, that, that yeah, we don't, we're not perfect, you know. I think I've surprised my daughters a couple of times when I've come home and they had it. How was your day? Well, it wasn't very, very good. I didn't do some things I should have done today. I didn't do some things as well as I should have done them. What do you mean? I mean, that, and so letting your children know that, yeah, we struggle with those things too as parents. Um, but the most important thing is that you care about them. Yes. Final comment. Uh, when, I, when, I was, when my kids were growing up, they used to come out in the yard and help me all the time. I'd be working on the vehicle. And there was a lot of times I needed help. You were on the inside, you needed to pull something, you needed to set the hand inside the car, or you needed to help cut the lead brakes. They helped me. They saw that I wasn't just do everything. There were a lot of times that they were a vital part of what I was doing. Had to help. And uh, so they learned, consequently, they learned how to build things. They learn how to fix things. Their, their in-laws go, you're the handiest person talking about Terry. You're the handiest person I know. 
Well, the most important thing was not necessarily what you were teaching them, but the fact that you were doing it with them. And I think that was the key thing. Whether you've been successful or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.